leaving the east gate of Yellowstone near sundown, somewhere between there and Cody, maybe halfway, and after dark, I saw a dark, bipedal motion moving out of the tunnel of light provided by my van. It was very brief, and when I got back to Florida at some point, I received a field and stream and read about the Skookum cast. After reading it, I went to the BFRO and found the Wyoming hot spot, and it all came back. I'm a cautious observer and realized how your eyes can sometimes play tricks. I asked my wife prior to telling her about the Skookum cast article or the other information about whether she remembered me saying anything on the way when she left Yellowstone. She said that all she could remember was me joking about seeing Bigfoot. I wanted to be sure it wasn't a manufactured memory because some time had passed. It was a long day and we had seen lots of wildlife and finished with a nursing grizzly with two cubs just before leaving the park. What I saw reminded me of a moose in color I've always described moose as being difficult to see at night by saying it's the black that moves at the outer limits of your lights. Often, you really don't get a clear outline of the animal, but know by the way it moves. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's 2.30 in the morning now, so forgive me, I'm a bit groggy. I was planning a trip back this summer to take a better look around. I was finishing at Masters last summer at Colorado State and had a week between classes, so we headed to Yellowstone in hopes of seeing a grizzly and the park. Had I been in Washington, I probably would have been looking for the Gigantopithecus. Many years ago, I talked to Dr. Krantz and Peter Byrne while working on a project for an animal behavior class at the University of Florida. When I called them, they seemed credible and were very helpful. My memory is from a second or two two strides that it took from the middle of the eastbound lane to the middle of the westbound lane to the gravel on the side of the road, dark and large. Half laughing, I told my wife that I saw a Sasquatch. She said, so did she. We both laughed and said we must be tired. She said turn around, which made me laugh even more. We're just tired. She pointed out that we didn't even know we'd ever get back. I don't think any more about it until I went to the BFRO, but I'll be going back this summer, probably June, depending on the cost of gas. It's getting crazy again. I am an outdoor enthusiast who was visiting the Cody, Wyoming area this summer during the second week of July, right around the 14th. While traveling the highway to Yellowstone National Park, about 40 miles west of Cody, I encountered heavy tourist traffic late in the day. I decided, rather than fight it, to pull off the highway for a while and go for a walk. I hiked up an unmarked path north of the highway through intermittent timber. I was traveling at a leisurely pace, exploring rocky outcrops and looking for Native American artifacts. Well, about a half mile from the road, I could still hear traffic. I heard some rocks rolling downhill ahead and above me. It was maybe a hundred yards away. Mule deer and other game animals are plentiful in the area, and I didn't think much of it. I had bear spray with me, as this was a well-known grizzly country. Maybe another half an hour went past and I was taking a break, sitting on a rock ledge with a good view of the valley to the south. I heard underbrush breaking not far away on a steep, timber-covered slope that led down to a dry stream bed. I was able to distinguish the pattern of an animal walking through the trees. Again, I didn't think much of it. I'm used to hearing game in the woods and don't spook at stuff like that. I guess that it was probably deer feeding along the slope. A little odd considering the time of day. Its behavior was highly inconsistent with bears which don't hang around when people show up. I began hiking again, and almost immediately heard something move through the brush just below me in the same spot. This was a little strange, I thought, like it was staying with me or something. 
I tried to see down the hill, but when I stopped, I couldn't hear it. It seemed to stop moving when I did, and I couldn't get a fix on its location. I began to get a somewhat uneasy feeling about things at this point. There is no good way to describe it, other than something seemed to be intentionally staying with me. I started walking again, shortly after, not having heard anything for a little while. I heard something run across the rocks, not far up in front of me. It was up and out of the drainage at this point. I was getting a little apprehensive by this time, and decided to start back towards the road, which was maybe a mile away. I walked pretty quickly, and for most of the way, I heard nothing. But about a quarter mile or so from the highway, and maybe 15 minutes since I turned back, I heard rocks and debris falling down slope again. It seemed awfully close, and I instinctively whirled around, thinking that I might see something, which I did. So I will do my best to describe it to you. But as I only got a short glimpse, I can't be too sure of what it was. It was about 60 or 70 yards away, on a rocky slope, immediately adjacent to the same heavily timbered slope I had been hiking along. As soon as I turned and looked at it, it jumped right into the cover and completely out of sight. There is one thing I am absolutely certain of. Whatever it was, it was upright. I could clearly see two limbs of the ground that appeared more like arms than legs. They were definitely hanging down the side, and not down the front, as one might expect of a four-legged animal standing on two legs. This doesn't mean that it wasn't a bear, but I've never heard of a bear acting like this thing was. That is, if I'm right, and it was the same animal that I feel was following me all along. You hear about predatory bear behavior, where they follow people though, so who knows? At any rate, the animal was brown, with very long hair. I noticed that when it leapt into the woods. The hair on it kind of swayed to one side from the sudden motion. It seemed longer than bear hair though, and to notice this swaying effect at this distance, I would guess that maybe the hair was a foot long or more. Also, for just that initial instant before its flight, I got a pretty good look at its face, which was long and somewhat flat. It was too far away to clearly make out individual features though, but I have seen several bears at greater distances, and it didn't strike me that that's what it was. I was not aware of the BRFO at the time, nor of the occurrences detailed in it for this area. When I mentioned this incident to a friend, who had not heard of the BFRO either, we did a search on Bigfoot out of curiosity. I was a little astonished to see the main page indicating this region as potential Bigfoot country with many sightings. I figured I might as well say something. I think all three of the other incidents had witnesses and I didn't, so I can't point to another who can verify anything that I saw or heard. It would have been nice just to see if somebody else had seen something resembling what I think I saw. Trust me when I say, it takes a little bit of time for it to fully register in your brain. You just don't think right off, hey, there's a Bigfoot. I was probably almost at my vehicle before I even let that thought even enter my mind. I can't say for sure what I saw, but I had been hearing it through the woods throughout the entire hike. One tends to make these connections afterwards, but I really have no way of fully knowing. I will say, however, I think that it might have been, but this is based more on a feeling than anything else. I realize that breaking branches and rock slides don't exactly constitute scientific certainty. It really was like something was checking me out though, that's for sure. And again, the incident had occurred in the late afternoon the weather was clear at the time, with great visibility, so there was no real mistaken identity. There might have been intermittent thunderstorms in the region, but there was no rain at the time. It was the winter of 1980. My older brother and I were hiking and camping in Yellowstone Park. After a five mile hike from the road up to a lake that reportedly was the only place in North America 
to catch Arctic grayling, other than in the Arctic, we set up camp for the night. After eating the day's catch and cleaning up, we settled in for bed early, as we were tired from the day's hiking and fishing. We were in our tent, quietly talking and starting to get drowsy, when all of a sudden, something ran by us on two legs, something very large and heavy. We looked at each other, with eyes bulging out of our heads, and I told him just to go see what it was. He replied, no flippin' way. And as we had no sidearms or weapons, we just sat there terrified for the rest of the night. At daybreak, we broke camp and left there looking for tracks, but the ground was bare and there was no sign of our midnight visitor except for our own personal experiences. I'm going to keep the park that I work at anonymous because I still currently work there. But in the past four months, since this whole COVID-19 craziness, there's been some bizarre and disturbing things happening. For example, the biggest one is we've been finding human remains being hung up randomly in the trees throughout the entirety of the whole park. I know that might sound disturbing, but I promise you, it's only a small segment of all the disturbing things that have been happening. Sometimes, we only find one of these human remains once a week, or even one every couple few weeks. Other times, we find three to four a week, and it's never in the same spot. It's always spread throughout in random locations, but always left hanging by a rope in a tree. The human remains in question just happen to be skulls, perfectly preserved skulls, not too weathered, not rotted, just as if they were left there to be taken by nature. And because a form of human remains are involved, police have an ever-going investigation, and forensics, from what I know, have shown so far that every skull retrieved and recovered is from a missing person who has been gone for at least several years. It's very disturbing, I will admit that, and we're not sure who is putting these up or why. So far, we have no leads, and we can't find any traces of any individuals putting these skulls up in trees. But I'll let you know if things continue to happen. I will share with you, however, that I do work in one of the largest parks in the entire country, and that I have a huge staff that I work alongside with. And unfortunately, I'm not the only one finding these skulls. Like I said, there's a lot of ground to cover because this is such a huge park and there are many others in our team that are finding these, along with other various human remains, like feet, for example, and sometimes hands, all in skeletal form. Working in the forest service and participating in search and rescue, it's not necessarily uncommon to find human remains, especially those of missing persons, and even more so of missing persons who have been gone for a while. But this is on a whole new level, of disturbing. It's definitely not likely to find missing remains of people found attached to ropes and only parts of their remains. It's almost like something or somebody is setting it up for us to find in some morbid way. I don't know if this is a group of people or one individual, but these skulls are placed up in places that normal people couldn't actually get to. For example, there's an instance of the park where we found three skulls in the past two months, where there's so much brush, normally, you have to have pretty thick gear to get back in there. And if it weren't for our heavy equipment, and to know that this area is there, you wouldn't even know to get back there. It's really hard to explain. I'm probably not making much sense. But what I'm trying to say is for just some innocent bystander to sneak back there and place a human skull. There would be no reason he would have to be heavily equipped with the right gear to get back there. And we would all see him, since we keep a pretty good eye on the park, after all. Anyways, I'll keep in touch with you and write you back if we find anything new or exciting to write about. For now, just know that disturbing things are still going on all throughout the country, and not just in our neighborhoods with COVID, but even currently in our national parks. Stay safe.
So I don't work in the forest service anymore, but I used to for quite some time. And when I did, I had a variety of stories that I could tell you, but I'll keep those to myself for now. What I will tell you about though, is for a short period of time, when I was working around the Lower East Coast, I would encounter bizarre lights going off in the forest in the early morning hours. See, I worked the nights. I don't necessarily want to say the night shift, but I worked early morning hours. And from where I was in my station, I had a perfect view of a specific area of the park. Now, the park I worked at was quite a few miles large. I don't know the exact size, and I'm kind of afraid to give you the name of the park because I worry that this will get traced back to me, and I don't want anything coming back on me, like lawsuits or any sort of harassment. You know, I might be being paranoid, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Anyway, the lights that I'm talking about were not normal lights. If you're thinking I'm talking about fluttering flashlights, no. While the lights I saw did flutter and pulsate, it was similar to that of a really bright flash to a camera, but longer lasting and sometimes brighter. And again, the light would sometimes change colors and it would pulsate with no real timing or pattern to it. It did not match any light pattern or any person turning their lights on and off. It made virtually no sense. Sometimes you would have multiple lights going off in different locations, but all completely visible from my location. At one point, there were six lights going off at once, all doing different things, one pulsating, one seeming to flash, while the others just completely would die out at random intervals. This was very strange, and after this kept happening, night after night after night, it really began to creep me out. So I finally told my boss about it, and I was really shocked by how he treated me. He kind of berated me about it, told me to hush it up, and keep quiet, and it was in my career's best interest to ignore it and just resume my duties and do what I was told. I figured something was up, but I didn't care enough to poke and prod even more to dig. I never did find out what those lights were, but then again, do I really want to? I don't know. Now that my mind and knowledge has been open to all the available park ranger stories and tales out there, Although I'm sure some are creepypasta stories, while others probably hold genuine truth. It's interesting to note that there are many, many, many cases of strange things happening all throughout national parks, and what I experienced was just a fraction of what some other rangers go through. That in and of itself is terrifying to think about. I'm glad I got out of that job field when I did. Okay, so first off, I didn't believe in Bigfoot before this whole experience that I went through. But now, I know they're very real. And whether they're humans or creatures or part ape, I don't care. They terrify me, whatever they are. No matter what Bigfoot expert says that how peaceful they are, I don't buy it. I had my experience, and nobody can tell me otherwise. So... I and a few other rangers had the liberty of permanently closing down a trail and the fear of safety of hikers and travelers because, well, apparently, a very hostile group of Bigfoot were traveling through the area and began throwing rocks and logs at people who were hiking among this section of trail. In the month of this happening, we had received at least five different reports of seeing these large, hairy, humanoid beings that looked to be half-man half ape, throwing rocks, screaming, wood knocking, and making all sorts of racket. We ourselves got to see these things firsthand when we went to go check out the area. Me and my coworker, who were not believers before this, are now, when we got to see what we believed to be the big alpha male, who nearly threw an entire dead log at us. This thing charged us out of the tree line, and we also had rocks thrown at us, and all sorts of noise and screaming, there was also occasional wood knocking and other noise like pounding and thudding and all sorts of crazy thrashing around in the forest. And to be honest with you, just thinking back to the event and reliving it in my mind is utterly terrifying 
because growing up my entire life, I was always told like everybody else, monsters don't exist. Oh, Bigfoot? Don't believe in that. They don't exist. Yada, yada, yada. Well, I'm here to tell you that people will lie to you, and they have been. These things are very real, and we have to be very careful not to piss them off even more. From my gathering of this series of events, they are extremely territorial, and who knows what would have happened had we stayed around longer, or possibly provoked it. Since then, that portion of trail has been indefinitely closed down. I don't know if it's going to be permanent or not, but that is until my boss gets a hold of somebody to deal with that situation. This only happened in the past few months, so it's still pretty fresh. It was right before the whole quarantine happened, so maybe it was early March. It was just as spring was starting to come, so that's when we encountered it. I have worked at this job for a while now, and I've seen my fair share of stuff, but this takes it to a whole new level. And no, to ask anybody who wants to know, I haven't seen any stairs in the woods or any of that crap. I don't believe in that, but what I went through, I definitely can't deny that it's changed my outlook on my entire life and my job. Will I stay in this job field long term? Probably, because even though this happened to me, I still do love working as a ranger and I love being a part of search and rescue. But it's just sometimes I'm guessing I'm having to cope to deal with there are things out there in the woods that I might not exactly be mentally equipped to handle. And I'm talking more than just finding dead bodies or even missing children. What I've learned from this experience is there are things out there that are far worse than any of those things. Things from your nightmare that you wouldn't normally believe exist. I just got back from a region known as Madawaska Valley in Renfrew County, about three hours north of me. It is located on the southern edge of Algonquin Park. Several reports have come out of that park, including an encounter I had back in 2008. I had a different experience with three of my other friends in that same park, which involved rock throwing, odor, and even feces found. My family and I rented a cottage this week on a small private lake called Spectacle Lake. The cottage is surrounded by forest and the region has a good population of moose, deer, wolf, beaver, and even bear. On Monday, July 27th, when we arrived at 1500 hours, we got unpacked and got settled in for the afternoon. At 1800 hours, we had a nice dinner and then sat around a big bonfire at approximately 20 hours. At about 22, while sitting and talking around the fire, I heard something across the lake in the distance. I told everybody to be quiet because I could hear something above the sound of our fire. I then heard these series of howls come from across the lake. The distance across the lake is about 500 meters. The area has thick forest with cliffs in the background. The howls seem to come well beyond the distance across the lake and even beyond the cliffs behind the tree line. I would estimate the cliffs to be approximately 150 meters high. There are no cottages directly across the lake. There are three small cottages at a distance to the north of us. However, no one was at those cottages during the week. Having heard these kind of sounds before, I figured it was a Sasquatch, since I'm a stranger to that but nobody else in my group has experienced this before. And naturally, they were all taken back and quite excited. Everybody agreed the house did not sound like wolves, coyotes, loons, deer, moose, or any other kind of animal that we are familiar with. These howls went on intermittently for about a half an hour each, and they were about three to four howls each time. About midnight, the fire was dying down and we all headed into the cottage for the night. But just before going in, we heard a large branch break close by. I would estimate about 20 feet from the cottage in the tree line, and it was a clear, distinct crack of a tree limb. I would estimate the tree limb to be about one inch or more. Again, I knew what this was, having experienced this many times. 
and so I tried to peer into the tree line to see if I could see anything. I heard nothing else and saw nothing. I didn't want to shine a flashlight because I knew this might end the activity for the night. So I just went inside the cottage. We all went to bed shortly afterwards. At 3.30 in the morning, I looked at the time immediately. Something hit or threw something at the cottage very, very hard. It shook the entire cottage and woke all of us up. Keep in mind that this is a fairly large cottage that is two stories tall with a basement walkout and sleeps all eight of us very well. I knew what was happening and got up to look around. I wanted to rule out any of the kids or dogs possibly walking around and maybe knocked something off of a shelf in the dark. So I walked all around the house from top to bottom. Everybody, including the dogs, were in their beds. The dogs never moved from their spots, even though I know they heard and felt the bang. I looked outside and saw nothing in the pitch black darkness, so I just went back to bed. I lay there awake and listened for any other activity. Then, about a half hour later, I could hear something mumbling or grumbling outside the open window. That's the best way I know how to describe it. It was close to my window, but I still could not see anything when I looked out. I did not want to shine a light, hoping for more activity. At 4.15 in the morning, something gave a long, hard, scrape sound along the outside of the cottage. Then, nothing. In the morning at 6.30 a.m., I woke up and check the outside perimeter of the cottage and the surrounding area. The ground is hard all around the cottage, so I found no imprints. I went inside the tree line, but still could not find no definitive prints. I could see no handprints or signs of damage on the outside walls. I could not find the tree break. I could not see any rocks or sticks lying close to the cottage that could have been thrown. I also found no physical signs of the scrape either. The next night, Tuesday, July 28th, while sitting by our bonfire again, we heard the same screams and howl from across the lake. This would occur off and on until about 5 in the morning. There was no more activity of any kind on Wednesday or Thursday, but I heard these screams and howls again on Friday, July 31st, during the night and there were eight witnesses of us in total, either sitting by the campfire and in the cottage. The chances of somebody being out here and trying to play a trick on us is pretty minimal. The area itself is heavily forested on all sides for hundreds and hundreds of miles. This is all Canadian shield type landscape around the water's edge. It is a very hilly region in the Madawaska Valley with tall, visible rock cliffs and even some swamps. Wildlife is abundant such as bear, wolves, coyotes, deer, moose, beaver, and other small game, and plenty of fish. First backpacking campsite on the Western Uplands Backpacking Trail, Rain Lake, Algonquin Provincial Park, Ontario, Canada. I was lying in my tent, about to fall asleep, when the forest around me went dead quiet. It was an uneasy feeling. Then, I felt an enormous thud on the ground. The thud was totally silent and did not disturb my sleeping son. I thought that the thud was my heart giving out as it was followed by arrhythmia, and I was praying that this was not the time or the place for me to have a heart attack. I then thought I smelt a skunk smell, but when I breathed in deeper, a second breath, I smelt nothing. The forest remained calm, and I listened intently, thinking we were visited by a bear. The next morning, my son and I did some testing, as it is possible to feel vibrations from walking on the thin soil overlaying the shield rock, which sounds like hollow ground when walking upon it. We determined that whatever it was had to have been within four feet of the tent. We could not reproduce the amplitude of the thud, we did, however, discover where the animal came down from the trail into the campsite and determined that neither of us had walked that way that night. 
we also believe that a 400 pound bear could not have produced a thud, unless it jumped. I thought that it felt more like a thousand pound moose, but could not explain why a moose would come that close to a designated campsite. I also thought I heard a loon hooting later that night, but the hoot did not just sound right, as it was more of a whoop than a hoot, and much, much louder. There was a tree, about eight inches in diameter, that had been snapped off at about two feet above the ground, and was there when we arrived in camp. The splinters were fresh on the ground and not covered by other forest debris, such as pine needles and nearby ground conditions. The tree had been snapped off. I noticed this as I cut the splinted end off the stump for firewood in the morning. It had not been chopped down or cut down. It was just a stump. I did not think anything of it at the time. A dead tree blown down in the woods. But in retrospect, it was fresh. No debris on the stump, which begs the question, where was the fallen tree? Surely somebody could have burned it up all that day. There was not enough fresh ash in the fire pit when we arrived. And also, who cuts up a fallen tree and hauls the whole thing off for firewood? I'm not even so sure that the tree was in that condition when I first surveyed the site, after having went forward to survey the second site and return the first. I didn't notice until after my son and I were both off site for some time, hanging in the bear bags. Finally, earlier that night while preparing for bed, I asked my son several times, what? Thinking he was talking to me, but not understanding him. But he said that he said nothing. Listen, I've been in bear country before and had to chase one off before. But there when my son was seven, not 12, which is now, and took my daughter, who's 16 months old, last week. But I can honestly say that this was the most scared that I have ever been. If it was a Sasquatch, or whatever they are called, I think I know why they are unhappy with our presence. I tested a bear banger flare at the bridge, just to make sure there was one in working order. The wind caught the flare and blew it into a tree. Stupid me. It was embarrassing, having to tell my son to wait on the trail while I investigated to make sure my idiot moment didn't catch the forest on fire. How careless of me. Anybody having observed this stunt would have judged me for a rookie and wouldn't want me camping near them. And, well, I am, when it comes to backpacking. I have done wilderness canoe camping in areas like this dozens of times through. The place was littered with moose and bear sign, with many bare footprints that seemed large and elongated, more so than what I am used to seeing. Everything was not adding up, and decided to hike out, giving up on the last seven days of our adventure. While walking out, I had the feeling of being watched, and even noticed something large in the bushes about 40 meters away. Upon investigating and finding nothing, I just assumed it was an overactive imagination. But the more I think, the more things begin to add up in my mind. I was cutting firewood in a designated timber cut area with my brother, approximately halfway between Cody and Yellowstone. We were south of the highway, very near the north bank of the North Fork, an easterly flowing tributary of Buffalo Bill Reservoir. The timber in this area is not dense and affords good views of the high north-facing mountain slopes south of the river. Shortly before sundown, I noticed movement up on the slope across the river. At first, I concluded that it must be a bear or elk and pointed it out to my brother. My brother fetched the binoculars from the pickup just to have a closer look, as we are hunters and like to keep track of where we see elk. At first, he seemed startled in that he didn't recognize what he was looking at. Rather than a jump to a conclusion, he handed me the glasses and asked me to have a look. By the time I got the glasses up, the animal had disappeared into the tree line and I couldn't see it. Shortly after, I noticed it again 
lower down on the slope in a small clearing, moving all the while. At this point, I would estimate the creature at a quarter mile from us, moving closer, down slope towards the river. This time, I got a good look at it through the glasses. It was definitely, unmistakably upright, walking on two legs. Though there is no way to say at this distance, the specimen appeared to be between 6 and 10 feet in height. More striking, however, was its mass. The creature, covered in dark hair, almost seemed fat, maybe obese. This was no bear. I saw it walk for a good 100 yards, and it never came down on all fours. There is something on the North Fork that I have sure never seen before. About a half an hour after my last sighting, we were loading the truck. The chainsaw wasn't running, so we could hear reasonably well. The river makes some noise. Right before we left, almost completely dark, I heard a high-pitched, eerie squealing noise coming from a few hundred yards up river. I have never heard anything like it, though it is about the right time of year to still hear elk bugle. This was no elk, ladies and gentlemen. The sighting was witnessed by my friend and myself, both of whom are geologists, while driving into Yellowstone from Cody for employment at the park for the summer. My friend was taking his turn at driving, and I was soaking up as much as I could and see, as well as providing a running commentary to keep my friend alert driving our long drive. As we came around a curve in the road, our high beams illuminated a large, dark, shaggy figure coming up out of the ditch on the left side, south of the road, at a distance of about 250 feet. As we approached the figure, at a speed of about 45 miles an hour, it looked first at the vehicle. We noticed the yellow reflection from its eyes that is seen in a dog's eyes when light catches it at night. Then it deliberately turned its head away from the lights. That motion was non-human or bear-like in that the shoulders, chest, and head moved simultaneously as it caught sight of our vehicle and then turned its face away from the headlights. We slowed. Well, actually, we slammed on the brakes, stunned at what we were seeing and trying to rationalize what we were looking at. Some sort of hominid creature, perhaps seven and a half feet tall in height, we have a seven-foot-tall friend as a reference, massing perhaps 600 to 800 pounds without obvious signs of obesity, standing completely and comfortably upright, came up out of the ditch from the left side of the road right at the edge of the metal barrier above the culvert. It took three extraordinarily long and fluid strides across the highway, 22 feet in total, and another three of four shorter strides down the other side of the road, actually appearing to catch hold of the metal barrier and railing with one long, fingered hairy hand, with finally swinging down under the road into the box culvert or channel bottom, completely out of our line of sight. We stopped the vehicle within 25 feet of the culvert and watched the final descent of the creature into the darkness of the channel. At this point, we sped on toward the east gate of Yellowstone National Park, hoping to find a ranger to report the sighting to, and perhaps to go back and take another look. There was nobody at the gate, due to the late hour, and we didn't see any lights on anywhere. So we just continued on to our destination, and went to bed, deciding not to contaminate each other's observations with discussions until morning. In the morning, we both independently described graphically and in writing as much of what we had seen six hours before. This is a synopsis of our finding. There were virtually identical down to the movement of which leg moved first as the creature crossed the road. The head appeared to merge into the neck and there was no snout or protrusion from the face as would be commonly seen in a bear. Trust me, I've seen hundreds, up close and in person. The face was not clearly visible and was only glimpsed for a moment. We both got an impression of long hair covering some of it. The nostrils were large and open, 
but neither of us were able to describe mouth or teeth. The eyes weren't exceptional, just the reflection of gold, just like a dog's. What each of us can still describe with great clarity is the size, shape, and unique fluid movement of the creature. It was large, easily seven to seven and a half feet-ish, but not much bigger than that. It was very heavy and powerful looking. In shape, it possessed a rather blocky, yet elongated head, slightly domed on the top of the cranium, thick, short neck, broad shoulders and a full chest. It was square and longer through the torso and hips than a human. And as it walked across the road in front of us, the buttocks were clearly seen as muscular masses moving under heavy, shaggy fur. They obviously attached to long, powerful muscular thighs, longer in proportion to a human. Big knees that functioned as a human knee. Thick, muscular calves and feet in proportion to the rest of the oversized body. The soles of the feet appeared to be hairless, or less covered in hair and very dark in color. The arms hung from heavily muscled shoulders and were longer than a human reaching to the knee length and extending fully, and almost a horizontal position to the front and rear of the body as it moved. The elbows were perhaps a little further down the arm than on a human or the usual length of the arm made it appear so. The hands were large and long-fingered. Neither of us could really describe the palms, nails, or other than the backs of the hands, which were covered in the same long, shaggy, dark brown hair as the rest of the creature. The creature made no sound nor gesture throughout the sighting. It appeared a little startled at our vehicle appearing out of the night, but in no other way frightened or threatened. It certainly startled both of us though, that's for sure. April 20th, 2003. A friend and I were carrying in supplies on foot to a bear bait site, about two miles west of Highway 89 in Wyoming. This area is restricted to foot or horseback only and is on the Idaho-Wyoming border. I had carried in the bait barrel and some bait items a week earlier, having noted some bear tracks in the snow along the creek on the first week of April. We walked along the foot trail early morning and about a mile in came upon the fresh carcass of a muskrat right on the trail, which was about 30 feet up from the creek and along the bend of the mountain. We were both startled by the dead muskrat because there was just no evidence of a predator in sight. I suggested that it may have been dropped by an eagle. But honestly, there had been no sightings of eagles on our walk either. Another mile in, and we began placing our bait in the barrel. Having noted that the bait was already there, that had not been disturbed by anything, we were preparing to leave the site when we heard the cracking of branches and looking in the direction of the noise, we watched a large piece of tree tumbling down the mountainside towards us. About 400 yards up on the ledge stood something bipedal, the color of a moose leaning against the remains of a tree. I nudged and asked my friend, What is that? He replied, Must be a moose. And I answered, But it only has two feet. He did not reply, but started walking back to the trail. I looked back at the animal which was at least eight feet tall as best as I could estimate. Very broad at the shoulders, with legs that appeared long and thin compared to the rest of its body. It was hard to make out the shape of its head, as I couldn't see a neck, and its head appeared to be bent, looking down the mountain towards us. It then quickly moved behind the broken tree and into the tree line. I wish I had brought my binoculars that day, but in our haste to get on the trail that morning, I accidentally left them in the truck. My feeling while returning along the trail to the truck was almost myself being stalked. A strange role reversal. My friend moved quickly down the trail. No words spoken about what was on that hillside. When I recounted the experience a couple months later to friends, I had forgotten all about the part about the dead muskrat, which my friend quickly interjected to them 
as a very disturbing incident to him. Yet, he laughed when I told him we may have seen a Bigfoot, which he readily dismissed. This bear bait site, coincidentally, is along a drainage that connects to a larger creek near where a year ago, I had heard some strange and disturbing sounds on a mountain pass while hunting deer. August of 2017, me and my son were fishing in a secluded creek. The creek is very shallow in spots, so in order to access it, you have to wade fish. We fished around a low water bridge for maybe an hour and decided to head upstream to the next deep hole of water, just over some shoals. I knew that around the bend of the creek where the deep hole was, there were lily pads. So I instructed my son to be very slow and quiet on our approach, so not to spook any bass that may be feeding around them. Once we made the bend, I observed what at first seemed to be a beaver, about 75 yards away from us, upstream, where the water is deeper. It was headed towards some large rocks, but what seemed unusual about it was its shape. It was higher out of the water than any beaver or otter I've seen. The animal got close to the rocks and just stopped about a foot or two away from the cluster of rocks just in the water. If I hadn't seen it moving to begin with, it would have blended in very well with the rocks. I noticed my son was watching it too, and asked what is that, and I replied that I wasn't so sure, and that I made some racket with some cattle calls to maybe spook it onto the rocks, so we can get a better view of this thing. But what happened next still sends me into a mild state of fear, just recalling it, it started swimming back to the opposite bank and just stopped for about a second. Then it rose out of the water. Now, I know what I was looking at was massive because the water in that part of the creek is chest deep and I vividly recall seeing the daylight between its legs. It stood there, probably three seconds at most, but the image was forever burnt into my brain. It had a reddish tint to its fur and massive arms that just hung to its sides almost touching the water. I couldn't see any facial features because the sun was directly behind it. After what I felt was a stare down, it lunged toward the bank that it originally came from, which was an erosion bank, about 10 feet vertical wall, and it made it up using a tree about a foot diameter to pull itself with. Doing so, it pulled the tree, roots and all, down to the water. We heard it storming off in the thickets till we couldn't hear it anymore. My son and I wasted no time getting back to the truck. Haven't been back to that spot since. Now what I'm guessing is it was at the creek doing whatever it was doing and we caught it by surprise. It mimicked a beaver trying not to be discovered. I always heard about these things and thought it to be something to see one. I wish now I hadn't seen it. It filled me with terror and excitement but who can you tell? My son hardly talks about it and I keep it all bottled up inside. My son's father and I came home from Oklahoma to the Buffalo National River area. I picked a waterfall out of my waterfall guidebook that we were going to find. We chose Hideout Hollow. When we pulled up to the parking area at the trailhead, we turned off the car. Our windows were down because we were both smoking a cigarette. At that time, I heard what sounded like if you were in the bathroom and you heard your dog sniffing under the door. I asked him in a whisper, did you hear that? He said that sounded like heavy machinery off in the distance. I let it go because I was just grateful he acknowledged the sound. We started to head down the trail when I realized we left our hiking sticks in the car. So I ran to get them myself. I had a slightly creeped out feeling but didn't worry about it too much because I could still see him the whole time. Once I got back to him, we started down the trail. We were just starting to round the corner that goes to the left when we heard a rustling in the trees to our left. We both stopped and stared and looked. We saw a huge figure running through the trees. I thought it was a man at first until I realized it was totally covered in hair, medium chocolate brown in color. I remember seeing its arms in front of it as if it were moving branches away to protect its face and its hands were black. I whispered, what was that? 
and he whispered back that he had no idea. So I asked him if he wanted to go back. He nodded his head, yes, quickly. The direction it was going. It would have crossed the trail just around the curve. We turned around and started walking quickly back towards the car, both of us constantly looking over our shoulder behind us. I started asking questions to make sure we saw the same thing, and neither of us forgot. We agreed that it was on its hind legs. It was brown, and it was a lot bigger than us, and it was fast. Suddenly, something flew fast over our heads, a rock possibly, hitting leaves and branches. I turned and looked at my son's dad with a what the heck look on my face, and his eyes were huge. We ran the rest of the way to the car. I had never been so scared, and I wasn't sure we would make it back to the car. We immediately began second guessing what we had just seen, suggesting maybe it was a bear, a deer, an elk, etc. I asked him if he's ever seen a bear run like that on its hind legs, or a deer or elk that dark running, that smooth. He said no. We went to the Tea Kettle Falls area, but I was just far too scared and anxious to get out of the car again, convinced whatever it was could have easily covered ground by then. A Google search once we had service said only black bears live in Arkansas, and I'm positive that what we saw was brown. I didn't notice any smells, but since we're talking, I also did not notice if it was quiet or if any birds were chirping. I know I have no desire to return to the area. I get sick to my stomach anytime I think about it. We had begun fishing along a slough a few weeks ago, and we had been catching some good fish along it. So we decided to clear out our own spot for camping sessions along its bank. The strange things began happening maybe a week ago now. We were night fishing along the bank when my friend Jacob spied something across the lake, looking at us. I pulled the jeep up and shined the headlights across the lake, and he caught a glint of amber-like eyes staring at us. He and Jonathan, our other friend, said that the thing was massive, saying it could have went eight to nine feet tall easily. It was haunched over in a set of dead grass that stood pretty high up. It also had brown wavy fur, but other than that, I never got a good look at it, as it apparently fled before I could have laid eyes on it. Now, just last Friday, we all decided to go camping and ignore the previous encounter from that night. We set up late in the evening with the cloud skies rolling in. It rained on us a little bit, but we ignored the bad weather and even grilled some burgers over our open pit fire. Me and Jonathan eventually left Jacob alone while we went out and cut some more wood. After we left, my dog, who was actually a small dog, became really anxious according to Jacob. It would bark and howl towards the woods surrounding us, then whimper and whine to my friend. Jacob said he felt like he was being watched but didn't wish to ruin our camping trip. He also smelt an odor because the wind had happened to shift for a moment. He says the odor was like a very small, strong-smelling gym rat after a hard workout, but perhaps magnified by 10. We returned shortly after, and eventually, I took Jacob home because of his uneasiness. Jonathan and I stayed till about 1 a.m. when the encounter actually happened. We never saw anything though. Jonathan had been sawing down a small tree for more firewood when a loud whooping, moaning sound echoed just 30 feet behind us. The sound was unrecognizable as any animal we had ever heard, and we both spent many hours in the woods hunting together. He and I debated on the sound on the other side of the fire, nearest to the water, when it came again, and this time much louder and deeper, and it sounded even closer. I told him it was time to leave as the hair on the back of our necks stood up. I pulled my dog out of the tent. The dog is usually very hyper and happy, but on this night, he cowered and refused to leave the sanctuary of the tent. Once out of the jeep, he acted very quiet and sat in the back seat, unmoving. I was so afraid by this point that I clambered into the passenger seat 
and instead of going around to the driver's side where the sound was heard. We took off and left all of our camping gear. The bad feelings we had seemed to disappear once we had left the area. We came back the next day with our camp in good order, still, but my tent, which had been zipped up at the time, was open. I looked for any sort of sign, but could not see anything other than the burger patties were missing. Also, had an old hoe we used to shovel up leaves, which was halfway burnt. It had broken on us the night, but we moved it well away from the fire. It was found near the fire and partially burnt. We also found what looked like a footprint near the area of the sound, but we could not really identify it. It was bigger than my foot though, and I were size 13s. Around 5 p.m., I was driving down Highway 258 just to go to the store. We have had some recent flooding, so I was driving slower than normal and watching for deer. Along the way, I seen two different area of deer. One had three that I could see. The other was at least six. So on the way back from the store, I knew to slow down in those areas just in case. In one area, it was a rather sharp curve and I had seen the most deer there. As I came up on the curve, I slowed down and suddenly, something jumped out in front of my car. I'll call it a he from here out. He seemed to have been running from the pine tree line and took a, well, what I would call a leap, out onto the road. Then he was gone. It was only one maybe two steps on the road to clear the entire road. I had slammed on the brakes and just sat there in awe, wondering if I really had seen what I did. He, or it, was standing on two legs, lots of fur, and what I would assume to be at least eight foot tall. When he jumped in front of the car, he was about a car length in front of me. He looked to have had a large fish in his hand. I know how that sounds, but I swear, it was a long fish. My husband said it may have been a stick, but I'm a country girl, and I know my fish. His quote-unquote fur was longer than what a bear fur would be, and although he was dark brown, it had a reddish hue to it. The headlights gave us a good look of the color as it leapt across the road. There is a lake back behind where he was running, but he also jumped across to the right where those six plus deer were standing. We are going back at first light to see if he left footprints. It's so muddy that I'm hoping to see some. We hear sounds out here, almost nightly, of what we describe as Bigfoot sounds, but I've honestly never thought they were out here. It is just sounds you can't describe, so we call it Bigfoot sounds. I've had several friends and family hear them, and one of them will not stay outside long out here because she's heard it so much. When I got home, my husband came to the door to help bring stuff in and ask what was wrong. I said the deer out here are bad, and he asked if I hit one. I said no, and he asked why I was shaking. I didn't realize my whole body was still shaking. I began telling him, and I had tears rolling down, heart pounding, and still shaking so bad. It really shook me up, so much. Not sure what else to say. It was one of the most amazing, yet scariest things I've ever seen. I know I will not sleep tonight due to thinking about it and what exactly happened. I'm writing this because I think that I might have had a recent experience with a Bigfoot. I live in Springdale, Arkansas. Springdale is not very rugged as far as forest goes, but it can get pretty secluded in the right places. On October 10th, 2002, me and a friend set out on a trip to follow a creek just to see how far it goes because I followed this creek when I was young. This creek goes through Springdale and winds in through Elm Springs where there's nothing but dense trees on one side to the left and open fields to the right. Private property. Well, Elm Springs is not a big city and you would never know the surroundings where I was, not unless you own the property. It was about 5 p.m. when I decided that it was time to try and get out of the creek 
and up on the bank. We had been walking about two hours in and out of the creek, and I decided that we could cover more ground on land before the sun went down. Now, I'm about 5'9", and I guess the creek bed must have been about 7 feet high, so I had my friend C hoist my foot up while I got my knee up high enough to pull myself up. Now, the original plan was to yank him up, once on top, but looking back on it now, I realize how foolish this was, because I would have had to been extremely strong, because I probably could have just barely have had touched his fingertips from way up there. But it didn't matter, because what I saw when I got up on my feet scared the crap out of me. The best way to explain it is just to tell you that my heart sunk, and I was extremely stunned. When I got to my feet, I was facing nothing but dense forest or woods. Something caught the corner of my eye, about, let's say, 75 to 100 yards off. Just before getting a good enough look at it, I could tell it was big and brown. Now, I've never seen a bear before out in the wild, so immediately, I started to panic. I took one quick look down and figured I would break every bone in my legs if I were to jump, for the water was maybe only a foot deep. With all of this happening in what I would say just about two seconds, and keep in mind I haven't even been able to warn my friend yet of what I thought would be a charging bear, I looked back to see this thing, or whatever it was, walking extremely fast. It was then I noticed that this couldn't have been a bear. I got a clear look at it for just a second. I'll never forget what I saw that day. I remember its head, real long head, I guess you could say it was shaped kind of like an egg. I just know it wasn't like a human's. The eyes must have been dark because I couldn't make them out. I didn't really notice a nose either, but there was so much hair that it was hard to make out anything except for the head. The biggest thing I'll never forget is the height and weight of this thing. It was so big, legs covered with hair, so massive that it had to be the biggest part of this thing so wide, it had to have been as wide as a refrigerator. And comparing the legs to my legs, I would have to say that each leg made two sets of both of my legs. The shoulders were massive and could have been three feet or over from the shoulder to shoulder. I also remember how it walked. Besides taking extremely wide steps, it kind of walked with its front body slightly hunched over. I don't know like somebody with bad posture. The height of this thing was astronomical. The tip of its head was in the treetops. Now, don't get me wrong. The trees weren't that tall, but they were at least eight to nine feet where the limbs started to curl out. And I remember the head was up there with them. There's no way I could have jumped and touched the limbs. They were just so high up. So I put whatever it was that I had seen to be eight to nine feet tall. And looking back on it now, the frame could have easily held five to 600 pounds. The arms on it looked long and they swayed back and forth heavily. I don't recall any odor or anything like that for this thing was out of my view and I'd say about five, six, seven seconds. Now, I realized when I was getting up the creek bed, I had spooked the thing because it sure didn't waste no time getting gone into the woods and I was not about to follow it. So, with all this said, I asked my friend if he had heard anything, which he said no, just because of the running water. And I guess because he was down there, and I just said, man, I just seen a monster go into the woods. Of course my facial features were very solemn and serious, but he still didn't believe me. I repeated this several times to him, and I guess he could tell by looking at my face I was serious. He later said that my face looked white and pale. With his help, I got down back into the creek, but it did take a few minutes, and even then, I wound up falling back in the creek. Luckily, I wasn't hurt, just wet and scared. The sun was setting and we jogged and trampled our way back, never once starting to go back up on land. We talked and thought better of muttering such foolishness around for fear of people thinking we are nuts. Truthfully, I don't even think he believes me, but putting myself in his shoes, I probably wouldn't either. 
but you know, it doesn't matter. I know what I saw. So in closing, I have ruled out the possibility of a hoax. Why would somebody be out in the middle of nowhere in this kind of costume? How would they know we were even coming? And how do you account for the height and size? It was easily a foot taller than any human that I've ever seen. In fact, it was so tall, you can't even duplicate that kind of height. I hope somebody reads this and takes it seriously, because I don't know if I'll ever go into the woods again after this. At around 9pm at night, I was standing outside my house in rural Washington County, Arkansas, right near the Madison County border. While standing there in the yard, I heard a noise from the woods north of my yard. 16 acres of my entire 24 acres of property were thickly wooded. It sounded like a hooting, a deep-throated howl coming from the tree line. This noise occurred about three times within a 15-second time frame. At the time, my wife had just left the property about two weeks prior, and I briefly considered the noise to be made by my grandfather, who happened to live next door. I shouted toward the tree line, Hey! That's a good way for an old man to get shot. Afterwards, the hooting howl occurred twice more. My dogs, which are two coon hounds, a rat terrier, and a shepherd mutt, all bolted from the porch and headed to the tree line, barking and growling, as if they saw something. I ran to the house and grabbed my twenty-two, running out the front door and angling west along the tree line. I noticed my dogs dogging something along the wood line, with the brush and tree limbs thrashing about. I followed this thrashing line of brush, approximately 1500 along the wood line in the pasture behind my house. As I tramped along, I realized that my dogs were still barking vehemently, yet they were still in the confines of the yard. I was alone along the tree line, with my brush thrashing guests in the dark. I paused and observed the continued limb thrashing progressing toward the west of the property. Also, during this run, I could hear thumping footsteps as if somebody were wearing heavy boots. In sudden realization of my potential vulnerability, I returned to my house, whereupon I immediately phoned my next door grandparents. My grandmother answered the phone. I just told her that was really funny and she asked me what. I told her of my theory of my granddad hiding in the woods, just to scare me. She just told me, well, he's sitting right here. He ain't been out all night. Indeed, I spoke with him, and he certainly did not have the time to make it back to the house and decrease his rate of breath, 75 years of age within that time frame. I believe that I walked out of the house and disturbed an exploring Sasquatch who knows what it could have really been.